the setup for all these discussions is rather experimental, and it came out of casual discussions with other faculty members and with students, and a sense that a group discussion or a series of group discussions could be useful for us all as we think through these things. Um, and by the way, this is all rather casual, and some of you may not know, um, my name is Maggie Kilgore, I'm in the Department of English. Uh, I, I kind of perceive my role here as a bit of a facilitator uh, for the discussion that's going to take place. But what I've done is I've invited um, speakers, both faculty and students, um, who as I say I know are concerned about this, to talk at each meeting for about 15 minutes. Um, and the talks are of course are going to be fascinating in themselves and, and give us great ideas, but I think it will be important for generating discussion afterwards. Though what I would like to do is to save the questions and the comments till afterwards. I think that will be better because as we see the, the different themes and ideas that arise. Um, but what I will, will do is I'll introduce each speaker very briefly in turn. Um, let me turn to our, our first speaker now, uh, Suzanne Morton, who's a professor in the Department of History and Classical Study and researches and teaches in the area of 20th century Canadian social and gender history. Uh, she's the author of two books, Ideal Surroundings, Gender and Working Class Neighborhoods in the 1920s, and At Odds, Gambling and Canadians. Uh, co-editor of uh, collections on women in the Atlantic region, and she's currently working on two projects. Uh, one, I gather, is a, a biography of Jane Wisdom. Oh, 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 that's great. Yeah, that's from UT, UT Press, yeah. And then the next project is from National Industry to Traditional Fishery, the Lobster Fishery in the Northeast. Uh, quite a range of topics. So please, Sue. I'm always interested in the state regulation of people, and I think this reflects what I want to talk to you today about. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I think this is a really interesting opportunity. I want to stress three things about why I think humanities matter. Um, originality, negotiating the relationship between individuals and society, and as a framework of understanding the world. And I think for me, I'm going to I'd like to talk about this, what has happened to humanities after the Second World War, mainly in Canada, partly in North America, as a way to try and argue to you that the state of humanities always coincides with the political, economic, and social goals that are known in society. So this crisis in humanity now looks different, but this, the issue of humanities and societies has always been related to what's going on in society. So I guess I just would like to begin by having you think a little bit about after the Second World War. And I want to argue that humanities had a special place in the university because of one of the crises in democracy that the war left us with. Why did individuals go along with the Holocaust in a liberal democratic country? And so part of the basis of the humanities in North America in the post-war period was to try and create independently minded individuals, students who were encouraged to think for themselves. Connected to this, of course, were the horrific events of Hiroshima, when all of a sudden we were much more aware that civilization was on the edge of a list. How do we create cultural understandings in order to create peace? and for the world to survive. And finally, I'd like you to think about the impact of the Cold War on the humanities. And this meant that the universities in North America were particularly important in inculcating and celebrating Western liberal values that celebrated the individual, uh, innovation, and of what was perceived to be um, both innovation and originality were both seemed to have political and intellectual roots. This is a broad objective of celebrating the plurality and the superiority of Western liberal democratic countries. And we see this sort of broadly in terms of notions of citizenship, but I think we would see it specifically in the funding of new programs like Russian and Slavic studies. So part of the way in which humanities gets funded during this time period, again, connects directly to what's going on in the broader world. Part of what's also going on are changing ideas and ideals and ideas around democracy and the democratization of post-secondary education. And so it, during this period, particularly starting in the 1960s, who gets to go on to set post-secondary education changes dramatically. It changes, first of all, in terms of class, secondly, in terms of gender, and the feminization of the arts is eventually going to be seen as a crisis. Um, and, and a later class, in, or sort of like later ethnicity and race. This post-war boom is, of course, brought along by the demographic baby boom. It's largely demographic. 
and its economic these between 1946 and 1972. These are general years of prosperity and a period of nation building. And in Canada especially, part of the nation building project is done through the universities. Canada goes the route of public financing. So during this time period, universities go from primarily private fund based to public fund based. The state increasingly gets involved in the financing of the university. And this is partly the interest is because of beliefs in democracy. And I want to argue that a liberal democracy only works if there's social cohesion. You have to believe that you have something in common with the majority if you're willing to accept the will of the majority. And how do you create knowledge of others? How do you create knowledge of society? How do you create common knowledge? Part of it is through a common culture that the humanities helps facilitate. So I think we also have a willingness to participate. We, okay. The other aspect that's really important and I think we're naive not to look at is the way in which humanities education fit in really nicely to a managed economy of the Keynesian state. Part of the baby boom is not only all these people that we want to implicate with the right liberal democratic values, but we also want to manage their entry into the labor force. And you can see really clearly in Canada that state financing of universities, the bulk of the students are going to be in arts programs, coincides with economic downturns. Because if you can keep 18 to 24 year olds out of the labor force, that means generally numbers are going to get are going to be better in terms of your political will. So you have, I think we're naive not to understand the way in which arts programs especially are a way of managing the general employment of young Canadians. Okay, so everything changes in the 1970s, although the effects aren't completely felt until the 1990s. We have this general switch that we're beginning to sort of classify very generally as a switch from that manufacturing economy to a globalized finance capitalism. And so we have the so-called knowledge economy. But when we talk about the knowledge economy, we're primarily talking, and particularly we talk about the economic role of research, both in university funding and the national economy, we're talking primarily about the STEM disciplines. And so that's science, technology, engineering, math, and I would say it could be at McGill Medicine. And in those, that knowledge economy, we have to ask ourselves, where did, does the humanities fit? Compound with this knowledge economy, the other aspect of the globalized finance capitalism is the decline and the vulnerability of the nation state. Humanities were very much tied to the nation state. My discipline history, its origins from the nationalism of the 19th century. So in a globalized world, how, does the, how do you deal with humanities and nationalism? And also there's this new language of pragmatism. And unfortunately, I probably don't share Matt Keen's uh, view of McGill, of arts being the center of McGill. McGill, since its founding, was based on pragmatic Scottish utilitarianism. At the core of McGill was medicine and engineering. Um, in the 20th century, we bring in commerce, which becomes the business school. But at the very heart of McGill's culture from the beginning has always been this pragmatic utilitarianism, and arts has always been on the side trying to negotiate how to do something slightly different. Uh, so this isn't unique to us. I think it's an issue that probably almost 200 years people at this institution have been almost grappling with. We also have, though it's particular to this period, is commercialization of higher education, the allocation of state resources where the money is going elsewhere. And again, this is demographic. The 18 to 24 year olds who were so important at an earlier time period in the 70s and the very early 80s are not that politically important demographically. And because they're not engaged in the civil process the way that other generations may have been, I don't think they're necessarily politically seen as important by those who are governing us. So we also have issues of student debt and the decline of the middle class, which is clearly putting the cost of university education much more on to the middle class families, growing social inequality. So the democratization that we saw in the 60s and early 70s is now in question. So this is my understanding of what's happened in humanities since the Second World War. Very broad, uh, very general. Um, but at the same time, I think trying to argue really clearly that it always coincides with political, economic, and social goals. 
And I think it's also an argument about why the humanities matter. Change is perpetual. And so one of the things that the humanities does is it allows us to understand change and hopefully adapt for it. The, the, the issue is we don't, we don't necessarily teach students answers, but what a good humanities education does is it teach students and teach we learn ourselves to ask the right questions. And when dealing with change, the questions are necessary in order to get to decent answers. And we have to think really clearly about are we asking the right questions or are we not asking the right questions. Um, we also need to have the humanities, and we talk about a future that is socially, politically, spiritually, environmentally, and even economically sustainability. We need the humanities if any kind of democratic culture is going to survive in North America. We need it to preserve some kind of social cohesion, a shared bridging language of values and cultures in this increasing fragmented world. We need humanities as a basis for dissent and pluralism and adaptation because humanities bridge the individuals in society. And in order to deal with things like dissent, pluralism, and adaptation, we need to have some relationship between individuals and society and those, so it's very desperately needed at this moment. So I'm really pleased now, I think, to put to uh, to pass the, the the speaker's chair, I guess, along to Alex Ketchum. Alex is a PhD student in the Department of History in her first year. She's a graduate <coughs> of uh, Wesleyan and McGill. She's working on a project on feminist restaurants in North America in the 1970s, and I encourage you to check out her exciting cooking blog that she is co-editor of. It's a historical cooking project.com and it regularly posts new updates on the uh, the ongoing project of their monthly meetings of historical cookbooks and the tangible results that they produce at these meetings. Thank you. So as I'm sure you're all aware, you're not the first group of people to talk about <coughs> this about you, the humanities. A large number of scholars have addressed these issues. Stephen Polini, in What Are Universities For, in his chapter on the character of humanities, focuses on the way that humanities allow us to understand our human world. He especially gives attention to the idea of knowledge and how the humanities allow for a kind of thinking that allows us not, to, not only to construct knowledge, but to understand knowledge. Mark Nussbaum focuses on the idea of good citizenship in her work, Cultivating Humanity. She believes that democracy depends on the existence of the humanities. Then, of course, there's Helen Small's book, The Value of the Humanities, which is a critical account of the principal arguments used to defend the value of the humanities. Its purpose is to explore the grounds for each argument and test its validity for the present day. However, a simple search on Google Scholar will allow us easy access to most of these texts, and further searches will yield the writings of other academics and non-academics getting their views on this debate. And to be honest, many of the voices are saying similar things. Yet one of the contributions I believe that this panel today can make is to increase the number of voices in the discussion. I decided to use my time to give space to a variety of student voices in order to let us hear from more than just our small panel. I conducted a number of informal interviews and asked students at both the graduate and the undergraduate level about what they see the value of the humanities is. So, so here are some of their insights. You will probably notice a striking difference between the undergraduate and graduate students. I want to note that I collected these interviews in a very informal way. I asked some of my classmates and the graduate level women's studies research symposiums because they come from a variety of backgrounds, not just history. Um, some of my peers from the history department and a handful of my students from a 300 level course on colonial American history. While of course there is bias in my survey, the point was to demonstrate that in this discussion it is important to open it outward to all of our students and also show that we have a variety of opinions on our campus, no matter who you ask. I have chosen to distinguish between the undergraduate voices and the graduate voices because I think you will even be able to hear the difference between them but also because of the difference of the commitment the students are making to the humanities. Undergrads, three to four years, and graduate students, upwards of 10 years of study. The undergrad said that they thought the humanities are about more than just the course material itself, but rather learning how to learn, how to argue critically, and to understand information. They chose their major within the humanities because of their own interests, but they also believe that they are taking away tools of analysis and critical thinking. 
The students I talked with differed in terms of pragmatism. Some argued that majoring in the humanities was actually more useful than choosing a pre-professional program. When they first entered university, and even now, many did not know what kind of job they wanted. They like the flexibility that the humanities offer. In their own words, the humanities gives them a skill set to apply to any work situation. One student reflected that she would probably have to go to grad school to get the kind of job she wanted anyways, and that she might as well study what she enjoyed. Another student believed that the discussion shouldn't be about the job market at all. She thinks that education is about opening your mind. They all seem to agree with one remark. You can't just have a world of engineers and neuroscientists. That would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> the undergrads approached this question in a way that showed their awareness of the debate inside and outside the of the academy. And it seems today to be mostly outside the academy, where the economic usefulness of the humanities is discussed. They spoke to the economic benefits of the humanities, but also critiqued the focus of later employment. However, they did not challenge the terms of the debate. The responses by graduate students were quite different. One fellow studies major spoke rather poetically about the value of the humanities. She remarked on how she liked the, how the humanities demonstrates that we are always works in progress. Unlike the sciences, though she didn't want to make the binary completely distinct, the humanities are about the evolution of human beings. Humans through the lens of the humanities become a kind of living object that is not objectified in a hierarchical manner, but rather made into a process of sharing and exchange, allowing for further discussion and constant reflection. Humanities allow for fluidity. So, okay, that might take a little while to unpack, but ultimately she was speaking to something within, something greater within humans that call us to change and adapt. Now we can come back to all of their insights in a minute because I first want to talk about what the majority of students said when I asked them what is the value of the humanities. Most didn't have an answer. When I asked them the question, many said, I don't know. That's a hard one. I have nothing new to add. And some just bluntly said no and walked away quickly. <laughs> I received the I don't know answer from numerous individuals and including many PhD students who are dedicating their lives to this pursuit. However, the I don't know answer says a lot. They actually do know, but the reasons can be hard to form into words, hard to explain. Now, I'm ambivalent with naming this phenomenon a calling to the humanities because of the conversations I have with a calling. However, at this moment, I think it's the best phrase that I can think of. The humanities obviously have a value to many people, but when confronted with what that value is, many freeze up. Perhaps the issue is not about value, but rather an issue with the question itself. I think it is somewhat funny to try to put a rationale for doing the humanities into logical terms. I'm not suggesting that the humanities are entirely logical, but rather they offer more than logic, and to try to articulate them only in terms of need does them a disservice. I want to finish by asking if this is even a useful question to ask. I worry that the framing of the debate has been to justify the humanities to the, to the sciences, and that we have to let the sciences define the terms. If we're going to continue to ask this question, let us change the terms of the debate. Thank you. So, uh, our next, next speaker is Natalie Cook, who is a professor and award-winning teacher in the Department of English. She's published a biography and critical com of and a critical companion to Margaret Atwood, and she's the editor of What's to Eat? on praise in Canadian food history. She's the founding editor of Cuisine, the online journal of Canadian food culture, and the author of many yummy essays on food in Canadian culture. And she's working at the moment on a study of the phenomenon of food celebrities in Canada, 1890 to 1967. Thanks, Matt. I'm actually going to introduce one more person now, because um, I'm going to pass the baton to her about halfway through my remarks, and it'd be easier to have a transition, so I'd like to introduce Hillary Sloan to you. She's um, a friend of many of you, I think, but um, an MA student in English. Um, she's a world traveler, um, and she's working at the on a research pro project on the blue Bluebeard Tale. Um, what I thought I'd actually do is rehearse some of the ar arguments made to defend the humanities and critique them. I want to take a very hard look at some of the, the difficulties with these, these arguments and see where we stand. Um, Harvard has been going through an exercise. Um, it's concerned about the, its humanities program. There are humanities students in the social sciences, and they took a long, hard look at what they felt the humanities were and should be 
and it came up with a very interesting document. I'm going to start with the quote from their um, self-assessment. Arts and humanities, they write, last year, teach us how to describe experience, how to evaluate it, and how to imagine its liberating transformation. Humanities in particular, they write, exists at the nexus of illuminating reception and constructive evaluation. I'm talking a little bit earlier this year to our principal, we actually asked her, you know, what do you think the value of the humanities is? You know, why are students feeling the need to, to study the humanities? And she raised the issue of, of a very interesting concept. She talked about cultural prosperity. And she said, you know, a rich and, and healthy society needs economic prosperity, it needs knowledge, but it also needs cultural prosperity. And what the humanities afford us is an opportunity to enrich and strengthen cultural prosperity. I'm going to touch on a third defense of the humanities here, and then I'm going to start working on the critiques. The American Academy's Commission on Humanities and the Social Sciences in 2013 started to study the role of the humanities, and they concluded, quote, the humanities remind us where we have been and help us envision where we are going. We live in a world characterized by change, and therefore a world dependent on the humanities and the social sciences. How do we understand and manage change if we have no notion of the past, how do we understand ourselves if we have no notion of a society, culture, or world different from the one in which we live? And in that statement, I think you're hearing much of what Sue was talking about earlier on as she was presenting her perspective in defense of the humanities. There are two dominant lines of defense for the humanities. The first one, argues that there's a kind of unifying methodology which teaches portable <coughs> skills, critical, critical thinking, and communication skills. And we've heard this in, in a number of different ways. And I think there's some evidence to suggest that we are actually successful in teaching those skills. And that's the moment where I want to hand over to you. Uh, OK, so um, I actually came across a report from T Economics, which was released in October of last year. Um, and it repeats a lot of the ideas that we've already heard, but I do think that it's something uh, useful and somewhat comforting to hear it coming from a thing. Um, so essentially this report provides an analysis of the Canadian labor market, addressing common concerns such as the rise in temporary jobs, uh, shortages in skills mismatch, and the increased presence of seniors in the workforce. Uh, but the section of the report which I think is most useful for our discussion today is entitled are liberal arts degrees a useful endeavor? So, TV economists explain that there are three post secondary education markets in Canada. The first uh, is the kind of education received at community college or trade school. So, this is sort of hands on applied training. And then the university market can be divided in two. On the one hand, you have occupationally specific majors like business administration, healthcare, accounting. And on the other hand, you have the humanities, uh, which the report describes as encompassing general disciplines such as English history and liberal arts. So this report challenges the, quote, deep-rooted perception that there are too many graduates in the humanities and that there is a poor rate of return for pursuing such fields. Uh, it suggests that graduates with degrees in the liberal arts and social sciences generally begin with lower pay than graduates with more vocationally focused applied type university degrees. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. However, uh, what I found interesting was that these economists observed that given their training in critical thinking and generally better communication skills, once hired, humanities graduates tend to move up more quickly to the point where pay difference disappears within a few years. So while it may be harder for a humanities graduate to get hired initially, uh, once they are hired, they tend to excel in the workplace. The report also goes on to note that the top three skills that employers are having trouble finding among recent hires are critical thinking and problem solving, oral communication, and literacy, meaning reading, writing, and document use. So I think that um, we see the value of these skills, um, we see that it's commonly recognized in professional postgraduate programs, 
such as law school or MBAs. Um, the law school admission test, for example, is divided into four sections, and those are logical reasoning, reading comprehension, analytical reasoning, and a writing sample. Similarly, uh, though the graduate management admission test, or GMAT, also includes a quantitative section, um, the majority of what it's assessing uh, is verbal skills, integrated reasoning, and it also includes an analytical writing assessment. So as key economics notes, liberal programs teach students to think analytically, question assumptions, express themselves orally or in written form, to appreciate different perspectives, and to acquire a set of personal and professional values and beliefs. So while vocationally focused programs arguably encourage their students to establish more focused educational and career goals, the report is essentially arguing that the foundational skills nurtured in the humanities equip liberal arts graduates for long-term success in the job market. Thank you. So now you've been completely convinced by Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to poke a little bit of this line of defense because um, it, it has some false assumptions. One is that the tendency to talk about a unified methodology in the humanities, and this is really a, a, a false notion. There are very specific methodologies that you can come to realize as soon as you speak to somebody who's trained in a slightly different humanities discipline. Um, and the other one is, I think anybody at the university would argue that they're learning critical thinking, and they wouldn't necessarily have to be in the humanities. So as we rehearse this argument, I think we need to be very careful to be precise and to understand the value of other methodologies in this place as well. There's a second line of offense, and this is one that you've heard from Sue a little bit earlier on, and that is ultimately that the humanities cultivate moral and civic character through exposure to a wide range of ideas, and as such it teaches a kind of intercultural fluency something that we badly need at this moment in time in, in a globalized society. Now, the problem with this one is it, it seems incredibly preachy. It's as though it's something one should study rather than one wants to study. It's, it's something that you, you have to learn as a, as a way of understanding and broadening horizons. And there's, there's something a bit difficult about that because it sniffs a little bit of implication. And one of the ways to to get around that is to think about humanities in the plural. That is exposure to a broad range of literature and a broad range of ideas. The humanities don't direct values. They don't impart the values directly. Rather what they do is raise awareness about what humans value. They pose questions about what kind of life would one find meaningful and valuable. What does it mean to be human? Through shared stories, they offer the collective wisdom on some of the best responses that we've been able to generate today. And we all study them and explore them, hoping that we too will be able to come up with some answers around. Thank you.